Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for Skin Deep, Preventing Discrimination and Providing Quality Benefits for Employees with dermat Dermatological Conditions, sponsored by AIMED Alliance and Dermacare Access Network. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credits. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, please click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them in there. And it's my pleasure now to turn you over to today's presenters. Hello everyone, this is Stacy Worthy. I'm counsel to AIMED Alliance. And I'm joined with Mike Walsh. Mike, do you want to- Hi, I'm Mike Walsh. I lead the Dermacare Access Network. We are joined today by three expert panelists that I'm going to introduce right now. Uh, first off, Dr. Steve Feldman is Professor of Dermatology, Pathology, Social Sciences and Health Policy at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. He leads the Center for Derm Research, whose mission is to improve the care of patients with skin conditions. Dr. Feldman, Dr. Feldman's chief clinical interest is psoriasis, and he serves on the medical board of the National Psoriasis Foundation. Next up, we have John Wylam. John serves as AIMED Alliance's staff attorney. In this capacity, John provides legal research and analysis to support AIMED Alliance's advocacy initiative. John also develops policy materials for the organization and manages content for the AIMED Alliance website and newsletter. And finally, we have Kelly Barda, who serves as president of ITSAN, which is a nonprofit that works to bring awareness to the potentially adverse events caused from long-term topical steroid use for chronic skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis. Kelly is a longtime sufferer of eczema, and after 26 years of prescribed topical steroid treatment, Kelly went through a harrowing withdrawal and now dedicates her time to help those suffering from the same condition. Thank you. So let's get started. We just want to uh, give a quick overview of the two organizations sponsoring this event today. First is AIMED Alliance. We're a nonprofit that seeks to protect and enhance the rights of healthcare consumers and providers. And Dermacare Access Network, or DCAN as it's often called, is a national nonprofit coalition comprised of a multitude of skin disease stakeholders who are all focused on promoting patient access policy that supports and enables approved treatments and appropriate clinical care for patients with skin conditions. So just to give a quick preview of today's talk, we're going to start with a, a, a talk on living with eczema. Then we'll move on to the economic burden of dermatological conditions, and then the dis disability and discrimination and accommodations. And we'll end today with a QA. So, that being said, we're, we'll turn it over right now to Kelly. Hey, okay, great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. First of all, I want to say thanks so much for taking the time to tune into this webinar today in order to better support your employees who suffer with chronic health conditions. It means a lot and it says about you, a lot about you as employers. So I'm honored today to have the opportunity to share my story with you on what it's like to live with a skin disease, in my case, eczema, which is a chronic skin condition that causes flare-ups of itchy rashes. The mainstay treatment for eczema over the past 50 years has been the prescription of topical steroid creams. And up until recently, patients have had very little in way of treatment options and disease information as the mechanisms and driving factors of eczema have been pretty mysterious. So fortunately, the last several years have changed all of that. So I experienced a very typical case of eczema, which was diagnosed in my early childhood. It consisted of itchy rashes in the crooks of my arms and behind my knees, and was managed by a lot of moisturizers and the occasional over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream. The rashes began to spread to my neck and my hands when I was around 12, which prompted more testing with an allergist and a visit to the dermatologist who prescribed topical steroid creams to manage my skin. This medication worked like a charm. Whenever a bit of rash would pop up, I'd just apply a thin layer of the cream and within several days, my skin would clear. But as with any chronic condition, steroids are not a cure, they simply mask symptoms. So the rashes continued to reappear and I continued my treatment regimen of topical steroids when needed, along with plenty of moisturizers. As time went on, my skin required higher potencies of the medication to keep rashes at bay. In my 20s, I noticed that the capillaries in my face were beginning to break as a result of using the steroid cream around my mouth. Fortunately, at that time, another drug had just come to market for eczema, an immunosuppressant called Protopic. My dermatologist told me that this would be safer to use on my face instead of steroid creams, so I managed my eczema this way for a total of 26 years, as Mike said. 
you see from the pictures that my skin looks pretty healthy, except for the blotchiness on my arms, which was a result from the turnover in my skin after a flare up. And although my skin seemed manageable, I began to slowly develop a host of strange allergies. It started first in my 20s when I was working in food service. I had to wear latex gloves every day. Can you go back to the, the last slide? Thanks. <laughs> I'll get there all shortly. <laughs> um, it started because I had to wear gloves every day um, that were latex. And um, I started to get tiny little bumps on my hands that were really itchy and grew worse and worse to the point where I couldn't even be around balloons without having my airways begin to close up. Then I began to notice a lot more food sensitivities. My mouth would break out if I ate acidic foods like salsa or salad dressing. I began to have trouble with chemicals like paint and cleaning products. My skin started to break out if I tried clothes on to purchase or from certain detergents and fabric softeners. I really became concerned when I started to break out in hives when my skin touched the surface of the seat of my car or when I reached in my purse for something. I questioned my doctor and asked if perhaps my long-term steroid juice could be contributing to my heightened allergic response. And my requests were dismissed and I was told that trying to nail down what was causing my eczema would only drive me crazy that I had an incurable inherited condition and I would need to remain on steroids the rest of my life. Shortly after this, I was picking up my topical steroid pre prescription from the local pharmacy and there was a new pharmacist checking me out. She asked how long I had been taking the prescriptions I was picking up and when I told her about 26 years, a look of shock flashed across her face. It was only a split second, but that look really disturbed me and it made me determined to dig deeper into the effects of long-term steroid use. I discovered that yes, there is a correlation between steroid use and heightened aller allergic response. I found a study out of Canada that stated that the use of a good skin barrier cream with a use of a good skin barrier cream, um, topical steroid use could be reduced by 40%. So I decided to give it a try and little did I know, but I was weaning myself off of a medication that I had become dependent on and I was in for the surprise of my life. So over about three months, I lessened my use of the steroid creams until I was only using it on my hands, the area that had been most affected by eczema. I finally stopped completely using cocoa butter in its place. And within two days, the skin of my upper body began to burn terribly. This was accompanied by a bone deep itch. I ended up staying awake the entire night on the couch in so much pain I had to breathe like I did when I was in childbirth. I was trying to think of what I had done that could have caused these symptoms. And the only thing I had changed was stopping my steroid cream. So in the middle of the night, I started searching on the internet, like we all do, about steroid withdrawal, and I came across ITSAN, the nonprofit that I now serve. They spoke of a condition called red skin syndrome caused by overuse of topical steroids, a condition that could last anywhere from months to years. It was extremely painful and debilitating, that the only way out was through and that time would heal. As morning came, I went upstairs and I sat on the edge of the bed and told my husband what I believed was happening and that we were in for a couple of really hard months. I figured I would heal faster than those I had read about because I was such a healthy person. I had a really healthy diet. I exercised regularly. He agreed to support my decision to go through the withdrawal, and so it began. So next slide. The three months that I thought it would take to heal came and went, and my condition went from bad to worse. Our family had planned a trip to the mountains that I had to cancel. The burning in my skin became so bad, I couldn't even lift my arms above my head to undress. The tissue under my skin began to swell all over my body, giving me elephant wrinkles. My legs began to turn purple upon standing and would ache so much, I couldn't even be on my feet for more than 15 minutes at a time. I began losing weight so much so that I finally stopped getting on the scale. You can see that on the picture on the left. I was completely exhausted. My nerves became so raw, I eventually couldn't even be around people anymore. All I wanted to do was lay in a bed in a dark, silent room. Even though I was exhausted, I couldn't sleep at night. I would lay awake until around eight in the morning and would only then get an hour or two of sleep. I felt like a burn victim, like someone had poured boiling water over my whole body. I was in so much pain, I had to lay completely still in my bed and plan my trips to the bathroom or even to get food. Sometimes the burning was so bad, I even debated whether or not to reach for the remote to watch TV. My skin began to break into hundreds of tiny fissures and ooze out of foul liquid which made me have to lay naked on towels that were continuously changed. When the ooze dried, I would stick to whatever surface I was lying on. And when I moved to get up, peeling myself off that surface ripped open all of my skin again. All over my body, skin was peeling off in crazy amounts. I didn't know the body could reproduce, reproduce skin that fast. Next slide. The bath was the only place I felt relief, so I began to live between the bed and my bath. I was in this state for over one and a half years bound to my bed like a prisoner, watching the seasons go by out my bedroom window. My hair fell out. I developed a cataract and needed a lens implant. 
I developed mysterious random lumps on various parts of my body that were really scary and painful. And there was always that unrelenting, horrible itch that would come in acute attacks periodically throughout the day. It was intense, unending suffering 24 seven. And all this time, my husband had to take over my responsibilities with our kids. I couldn't be a wife or a mother. I couldn't work a job. I had to let go completely of life as I knew it. This condition impacted my whole family very severely. Fortunately, little by little, my body began to heal, but it took about three and a half years until I could start functioning somewhat normally again. Next slide. Around the four year mark, I had a life threatening outbreak of eczema herpeticum, a skin virus that's very common to those in our community going through topical steroid withdrawal. This is yet another frightening consequence of using topical steroids long term as they compromise the immune function in the skin so that when the body is exposed to certain viruses and bacteria, it's unable to fight them off like healthy skin would. Afterward, my dermatologist told me I could have picked it up from something as simple as having an open cut on my hand and touching a cart at a grocery store. But within three days, my skin erupting as a result of the exposure, I was completely immobilized with lesions covering nearly my entire body. Herpeticum attacks the nerve endings like shingles. It was the most painful thing I have ever experienced in my life. I was hospitalized and given round the clock IVs of antivirals and antibiotics because the doctors didn't know what they were treating at the time. My arms and hands were so swollen, I had to have IVs placed in my toes. It caused me to be bedridden again for a month. I looked like someone from the TV show, The Walking Dead. I had black scabs all over my body. I wouldn't let my kids see me for three weeks until I started looking more like myself. After that, my skin continued to recover and around five years, I no longer needed a bath every morning to calm the burning in my skin. Next slide. I'm now nearly seven years off the medication. My skin has more integrity than I can ever remember as a child. I'm extremely grateful to have my health back and am very passionate, obviously, about raising awareness to this potential, but very preventable condition. It's why I've gotten involved in the nonprofit It's Sand, which helped to guide me to health. I've heard the personal stories of countless, I mean thousands of others who have experienced the same as I have. Many have additionally lost jobs, academic achievements, and partners in the process. Some have even lost their lives. According to the National Eczema Association, around 10% of the population suffers with eczema. That translates to around 33 million people in the US. There has been some research into the prevalence of topical steroid dependence and withdrawal by several investigative dermatologists. And according to their results, they believe seven to 12% of individuals using topical steroids long-term will develop red skin syndrome. That means there could potentially be 3 million in the US who may be like I was, dependent on their medication and unaware of the ensuing health crisis. Fortunately for those who are unable to continue to use topical steroids, there are now new alternative medications for eczema like the biologic Dupixent and many others are in the pipeline. It's imperative that these patients have access to medications in order to maintain quality of life and keep up with responsibilities. This is where you, the employer, could really help in providing health coverage plans that include accessibility to these types of medications. I'd also like to add from an eczema patient's perspective, another way employ employers can greatly impact the lives of their employees with health conditions is by fostering an environment of openness and inclusion where your people feel safe enough to share about their personal health challenges with coworkers and employers and can ask for help when needed. Stress is one of the biggest triggers to chronic illnesses so by providing an environment that focuses on wellness and good communication, you're not only affecting those individuals in a positive way, but also their families, their social circles, and your community at large. Next slide. Thanks so much for listening to my story today, which is the story of many others. Please reach out to me if you have any questions or would like any further information. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing your powerful story. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, we're going to pivot now to Dr. Feldman. Um, so Dr. Feldman, take it away. Thanks so much. That was a great introduction showing what atopic dermatitis can do. Um, I'm going to be talking about economic burden of dermatologic conditions with a focus on psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. Next. <clears throat> I want to give you a sense of the overall costs and impact of the disease and treatment approaches and things that can help uh, keep costs under control. Next. 
So skin disease is extraordinarily common. In any one time, something like 25% of the population has some skin disease. And it occurs in people of, of all ages. Uh, even in the prime working years, you see one in four to one in five patients having skin disease. Next. This is psoriasis. Psoriasis, unlike eczema, has very well demarcated lesions. You, you, you can see where the, where the scaly red plaques stop uh, and then transition into normal skin very quickly. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, trying to define psoriasis is not as easy as defining diabetes. Diabetes is you don't have enough insulin action taking place. Psoriasis, we recognize, you know, we, it's kind of like what the Supreme Court said about pornography. We recognize it when we see it, these very well-defined red scaly plaques. The elbows is a, are a common area of, envi of involvement. Um, scalp, you see the belly button involved here. The knees are another, another commonly involved area, but they can occur on any part of the body. Next. Psoriasis can have various manifestations. The vast majority of the time, psoriasis consists of just a few spots, probably just on the elbows or knees, maybe with a little associated dandruff. But it can be little tiny spots of psoriasis all over the body. Then we call it guttate psoriasis. Pus cells are common in psoriasis. And when those pus cells form collections, large enough to see with the naked eye, we call it pustular psoriasis. That's a more severe form of the disease. When the psoriasis involves the palms and soles, we call it palmoplantar psoriasis. That can be particularly disabling um, to, to people's work and daily activities. Um, I mean, if you can't stand up because of the pain of, from the lesions on your feet, or you have trouble using your hands, it can be quite devastating. Erythrodermic refers to psoriasis being all over the body. Basically, uh, erythrodermic just means red skin. So if you're red all over with your psoriasis, that would be erythrodermic disease. Inverse is when it occurs in the body folds. It can be particularly annoying in the genital area, under the breasts, underarms. Uh, it can be very painful. Psoriasis can be associated with a variety of changes in the nails. I think this is important in the working environment, uh, especially for salespeople who, you know, are dependent on shaking hands with other people, showing their hands to other folks, having horrible looking nails uh, can impact work. Next. Uh, we have a lot of treatments for psoriasis. For limited disease, we use uh, a variety of creams, typically topical corticosteroids. For more extensive disease, we could give people ultraviolet light therapy or methotrexate. This is a patient who was treated with one of the biologics. If you watch any television at all, you'll see a constant stream of ads for um, new psoriasis treatments that are given by uh, either pill or mostly by injection. These treatments are have been revolutionary in their ability to safely control psoriasis and also revolutionary in terms of the higher cost for managing the disease. Next. This is a patient with atopic dermatitis. Uh, you see the involvement of the entire forehead here. It's been rubbed. The lines in the skin are more prominent than they are normally. This is very itchy. Uh, next slide. Here's somebody who has it uh, all over their back and all over their legs. Uh, the one on the left shows a lot of, of, of scratch marks from all the intense itching. And you can see atopic dermatitis is very different from psoriasis in that it's more diffuse. You, you don't see sharp edges to where the rash occurs and then stops and transitions to the normal skin. Most of the people who have atopic dermatitis probably have very limited disease in front of their elbows, behind their knees. But then there's the patients who have more severe involvement it's much more disabling. Next. A variety of studies have looked at the costs of, of managing skin disease. Uh, and it includes office visits, emergency room visits, um, prescription drug costs, the over-the-counter drug costs the patients uh, uh, purchase, 
sometimes some procedure costs, for example, for ultraviolet light phototherapy uh, visits. There can be costs for um, hospitalization and inpatient care, although there's much less of that now than there used to be because the outpatient treatments have gotten so much better. Management of skin disease is primarily an outpatient um, uh, issue. Some of the biggest costs for skin disease uh, are indirect costs of lost work and reduced productivity. Next. Uh, we looked at uh, the cost of psoriasis 20 years ago and found a, a cost of $800 per patient per year. I'm sure that's much higher today, uh, given the increased cost of the outpatient therapies we have, especially for some of those outlier patients who are on those injection therapies. The other thing we studied was the quality of life of people who had psoriasis. We use the short form 36, which is a general measure of quality of life, uh, health-related quality of life. It's not specific for skin disease, so it probably doesn't fully capture the impact of skin disease as well as more specific measures of skin disease impact would. That said, when you compare the impact of psoriasis to that of other major medical conditions, you find the quality of life scores are lower, which means worse quality of life with psoriasis than with other major medical conditions. So on the physical dimensions of quality of life, psoriasis was worse than just about everything except heart failure and, and, um, and chronic lung disease. On the mental health dimension, psoriasis was worse than pretty much everything other than depression. Now, someone once asked me, Steve, uh, you published that, that psoriasis is worse on these dimensions than cancer. How can that be? And I, I talked to my colleague who, who studied psoriasis patients with me and who studies cancer patients. And he pointed out, you know, when you get cancer, all your friends come over and they fill your freezer with casseroles. You get all this social support. And when you have psoriasis, nobody wants to touch you. Nobody wants to be near you. Um, the stigmatization is much greater than, than, than you would see in cancer. Next. Uh, atopic dermatitis also has an enormous impact on people's lives. There's both the direct and indirect costs. A lot of atopic dermatitis is in children, much more so than for psoriasis. And so missed school, um, in addition to missed work, uh, is a major issue. Next slide. And I pointed out to you that psoriasis was bad. When they compared the impact of atopic dermatitis to that of psoriasis on work issues, the impact of atopic dermatitis was even worse, was as bad or worse than the impact of psoriasis. Next. The productivity loss uh, in a, in a uh, Scandinavian study was the, the largest impact of atopic dermatitis. Next. The other big impact that people talk about now um, of these immune mediated skin diseases is, are, are the comorbidities of the disease. For example, a third of psoriasis patients also have arthritis. Uh, something like 20% of people with severe skin disease have considerable depression. But the most recent work has been on cardiovascular diseases, showing that people with severe psoriasis are at increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. So you see here, between the ages of 20 and 30, you had a two to three fold increased risk of having a heart attack if you had severe psoriasis. If you get to be, if you're lucky enough to be, get to be my age, you know, be in your 60s, there's like a 20% increased risk of having um, a heart attack, which is a, you know, once you get to be my age, age that's, a, that's a pretty big risk. Next. So the, the finally, the, in terms of the costs, uh, when you looked at the cost of skin disease in general, the ambulatory care and prescription costs is a big component of it. Inpatient costs, because they can be expensive when they happen are bad, but they don't happen all that often. Next. All right, so let's talk about managing psoriasis. Uh, 
Here's information from our National Psoriasis Foundation. Uh, they put together a book of algorithms for how to manage the disease. I think you can download the book from their website for free if you want more detailed information on psoriasis. In fact, if you want more information on psoriasis, great resource. Um, it, uh, our National Psoriasis Foundation is just a fabulous resource. The website is www.psoriasis.org. You can see here for the healthy adult who has, you know, um, moderate to severe psoriasis, too extensive for the topicals alone to be effective, then the Psoriasis Foundation was recommending phototherapy as an option. And if not that, then one of a variety of internal medicines, either pills like methotrexate, cyclosporin, or injectable medicines like these new biologics. Next. Uh, here is my general approach to managing patients with psoriasis. When I see psoriasis, I encourage patients to, I, I try to address their psychosocial needs by encouraging them to join the Psoriasis Foundation. Because arthritis is so, so common in these patients, you know, I'll screen for it and send them to rheumatologists for evaluation. If they're one of the 90% of people who have limited psoriasis, I give them topical therapies and try to get them to use them. If you thought trying to get people to use a pill to take a pill was hard. Getting them to rub something on their skin every day is much harder. Adherence to topical therapy is not very good, uh, typically. You have to really work at it. Uh, if the disease is too extensive for topicals, we may use topicals to the worst spots, but we'll use phototherapy or some type of systemic therapy um, to get the extensive disease under control. Next. The, um, cost of therapy has gone up considerably with the introduction of biologics. So uh, this study was done many years ago when the biologics available for psoriasis were primarily a tanercept and infliximab. And you can see that they raised the cost of, of, bio, uh, of treatment uh, way past cyclosporin, which itself was not an inexpensive medicine. You'll also see here that things like uh, phototherapy are relatively low cost treatments. And so we should be encouraging, not discouraging patients from having phototherapy. Next. Uh, here's more recent data on cost. And you can see um, th these are real world data that costs of 30 to $50,000 a year per patient um, are, are, are like, typical for the patients who are on some of these more uh, costly therapies. Next. These costly therapies are, however, cost effective, uh, uh, at least according to the um, institutes that study cost effectiveness. Uh, it's hard for a doctor to know which is the most cost effective way to treat a patient because the costs of these drugs are not transparent to us. Now, nobody tells us what the insurance company is actually paying for the drug. So um, we rely on what the insurance company says is their preferred product if we're trying to guess uh, what the most cost effective, the least costly treatments are uh, for that insurer. Next. All right, here is my... Um, my standard protocol again. And so when we see psoriasis, we work down to, is it localized or not? So if it is localized, we could treat it low cost with generic topical steroids. Although the price of even the generic topicals has just shot up lately. Uh, if patients need um, something for more extensive disease or for the palms and soles, where the skin is so thick that the topicals just don't penetrate, then I think phototherapy is a good option. Uh, methotrexate may be reasonable, although I don't like to prescribe it because the biologics are safer. And as a physician, I always want to prescribe a safer product first if I can. Next. One of the things that I think can really help reduce the cost of biologics, reduce patients' exposure to them, reduce the need for them, is a home light unit. It's very inconvenient for patients to miss work to come to my office for light treatments. And light treatments in my office are expensive. Uh, not as expensive as biologics, but they're expensive and they cost, and the co-pays, for some reason insurers charge patients co-pays for uh, visits to my office for phototherapy. If you do that, 
you're discouraging patients from having phototherapy and they'll end up on a $50,000 a year biologic. I think the ideal situation would be to give patients a home phototherapy unit. A home phototherapy unit that might last a lifetime might cost less than the first month of an injectable biologic. You know, if I was an insurance plan and somebody said, hey, will you cover this biologic for this patient? I would say, hey, here's a home light unit. Try it for three months. If you still need the biologic, let us know. And if the you know, even if the light unit didn't work for anybody, but I'm sure it would work for a lot of them, but even if it didn't, you still save money because you've kept people off biologics for a few months. All right, next and last slide. So skin diseases are extraordinarily common. For the most part, um, treatment of an individual patient doesn't cost a lot, but because there are so many people with skin disease, it adds up. And the new treatments for some of the severe patients with horrible psoriasis or horrible atopic dermatitis are absolutely revolutionary gangbuster drugs. And I love them and they're, I want them to be available for patients, but I realize they're also costly. And because of that, I only want the people who really need them to be on them. And so if you can you know, change policies that encourage lower cost treatments like home phototherapy first, you know, I think that has potential to both get patients clear and help uh, reduce the overall cost of uh, managing skin problems. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Feldman. That was really informative um, and very helpful. So now we are going to switch to a top uh, discussion on discrimination in the workplace and appropriate accommodation. So John, we're gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Dr. Feldman, for that eye-opening presentation. My name is John, and I'm going to discuss with you how all of this interfaces with workplace issues and the law. So first, I'd like to provide you with a brief overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, and the concept of reasonable workplace accommodations. The ADA was signed into law on July 26, 1990 by George H.W. Bush. This was the first civil rights law for people with disabilities, and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in the areas of employment, public accommodation, public services, transportation, and telecommunications. Today, we'll be focusing narrowly on discrimination against people living with disabilities in the context of employment. So as I mentioned, the ADA protects employees against being discriminated against by their employer. However, people living with disabilities may experience work-related challenges due in part to their disability. So how do we work through that in a non-discriminatory way? How can we ensure that disabled employees can fulfill their job functions without discriminating against them? In most cases, this issue is resolved by the employee requesting a reasonable accommodation from the employer. A reasonable accommodation is a work-related modification or adjustment that would allow a disabled employee to fulfill their job functions despite their disability. Employers with 15 or more employees will be required to provide a reasonable accommodation to a disabled employee if they request it, unless it would cause an undue hardship on the employer. When requesting a reasonable accommodation, the employee must disclose their disability to the employer, and the two parties should engage in an interactive process to resolve the issue in a mutually agreeable manner. We'll revisit that concept in a couple of slides. Next slide, please. So who qualifies for this protected status? While there are some conditions, such as paraplegia, that would automatically qualify someone as disabled, dermatological conditions aren't as straightforward. To determine whether an individual with a dermatological condition qualifies as disabled, the impairment must substantially limit one or more major life activities, such as the ability to work or care for oneself. A little later, we'll discuss some of the ways that a dermatological condition can impact an employee's ability to work. But the takeaway here is that disability status for dermatological conditions is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. So if uh, an employee requests from you uh, a reasonable accommodation and you're not sure um, if they have a disability that would qualify, uh, you can request additional medical documentation from them. But most importantly, we urge you to listen to the needs of your employees and talk with him or her to find a workable solution. 
So as I mentioned earlier, uh, not all dermatological conditions will qualify as a disability. However, an employee who is living with a serious dermatological condition could face challenges in the workplace nonetheless. A serious dermatological condition could negatively impact someone's ability to get a full night's sleep. It could make continuous walking or standing very painful or irritating, and it could restrict a person's ability to bend over and lift heavy objects. And all of these could interfere with someone's ability to fulfill their job functions. So there are many other ways a dermatological condition could impact an employee's ability to fulfill their job functions, but the ones on the screen here will likely be the most common ones that you'll encounter. So a person living with a serious dermatological condition would likely request a reasonable accommodation that limits their exposure to environmental triggers that exacerbate their condition. And common triggers uh, might include allergens, climate, diet, friction, skin trauma, and stress. Reasonable accommodations should be designed with these types of triggers in mind, in addition to other triggers that the employee might raise with you. Next slide, please. So when you're crafting a reasonable accommodation uh, to assist an employee fulfill their job functions, the solution that you come up with uh, should be tailored to the specific problem that the employee is having in the context of their disability. So on the screen here, we have uh, a couple possible solutions that uh, would address some of the issues we mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, and as the employer, you're given pretty broad discretion over the types of solutions that can be implemented. Um, so reasonable accommodations are most commonly used to augment the application or the hiring process, the functions of the job itself, the way the job is done, or the environment that the job is performed in. Uh, the main point I want to uh, make here is that when you're coming up with a solution, it's designed to be an interactive process between the employer and the employee. So the best way to go about this is usually to uh, identify multiple options that would work with the employee and work with them to select the best one that has the best chance of uh, fixing the underlying issue. And I also just want to stress that it's very important to document uh, all of these interactions with your employees when you're going through this process. Next slide, please. Reasonable accommodations uh, must always be requested by the employee, and employers are obligated to fulfill the request unless it would present an undue hardship on them. So an undue hardship would be defined as requiring significant difficulty or expense in light of the employer's business situation. And uh, just like when uh, you're going to determine if someone qualifies as a disability, um, the undue hardship inquiry is also handled on a case-by-case -case basis. So this means that the reasonableness of the request could in fact depend on the size and capabilities of the employer in question. So, um, you are still able to terminate uh, a disabled employee. However, uh, you have to be very careful that um, the termination is due to uh, them being unable to complete the essential functions of the job and it has to be unrelated to their disability. Um, you could also uh, terminate a disabled employee if they pose a direct threat to the health and safety of the workplace. Um, I would just uh, keep in mind that those exceptions are very narrow. So just make a note of that. Next slide, please. So in most situations, like I mentioned, uh, the employer will be obligated to provide a reasonable accommodation to an employee with a disability. So uh, we would recommend that it would probably be helpful for your employees if you enact a policy regarding reasonable accommodations so that employees know what the protocol is for requesting one. This would help employees feel more comfortable approaching you with such a request. If the request for a reasonable accommodation is uh, denied, you must document why and you should be able to explain that situation because it could come up later in court, it could come up later before um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or uh, an analogous state agency. So it's always good, like I said earlier, to document all these interactions. So um, we recommend working, uh, if the request is denied, uh, working with the employee to find an alternative solution that will uh, fix the underlying issue. If you do not offer a reasonable accommodation, uh, if 
when it is requested or if you unreasonably refuse to provide one, uh, the employee can file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, like I just mentioned. Uh, they could also do that with an analogous state agency. Uh, it's a complicated process to file a complaint with the EEOC, uh, but it could result in a lawsuit against you. Next slide, please. So this is just a brief overview of what the uh, EEOC complaint process looks like. Uh, we're not going to go through all this in depth, uh, but I want uh, you all to know, based on this slide, that there's three uh, possible outcomes. Uh, first, the, um, the EEOC could find that there's uh, merit in the complaint and they could try to uh, work it out with the employer privately. Uh, they could decide that uh, there's merit to the complaint, but they need more information, so they could open an investigation into the complaint. Or they could uh, dismiss the complaint uh, because there's not enough substance to it, or there's not enough information, or they don't have the capacity, or any number of reasons. Um, however, if the complaint is dismissed, uh, it's important to note that uh, that doesn't mean that the employee couldn't later file their own lawsuit. It doesn't mean that there's no merit to their claim. It just means that the agency is not going to pursue it. So next slide, please. I'm going to, uh, before I conclude here, uh, just give you all a brief case study and how all of this could play out in the real world. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the 2017 case, Bridgewater versus Michigan Gaming Control Board. So I've included a few factual details on the screen here, but I'll walk through them with you. Uh, the Michigan Gaming Control Board is a state regulatory agency that has jurisdiction over casinos and gambling in the state. The uh, plaintiff in the suit was an employee of that board, and his job consisted of him testing gambling machines. And one thing I want to call your attention to at the outset here is that the plaintiff's job function was rather unique in that he wasn't required to actually work alongside his coworkers. He wasn't required to keep hours uh, that were the same as his other coworkers. Uh, so just hold on to that because we'll come back to that a little bit later. So uh, the plaintiff in this suit sued his former employer, former employer for employment discrimination and retaliation. Uh, this uh, plaintiff was living with uh, dermatological conditions that caused disruption of his sleep, and he had requested a flexible work schedule from his supervisor. Uh, that flexible work schedule allowed him to work outside of normal operating hours, and it allowed him to work on weekends occasionally. So at this time, this was not a uh, official request for a reasonable accommodation. It was an informal arrangement between the employee and a supervisor. Uh, and so he was allowed to keep this alternative schedule for some time uh, until his supervisor suddenly changed. Uh, next slide, please. So once the plaintiff's supervisor changed, his flexible work arrangement was brought to an end. Uh, and the plaintiff was not happy about this. So he went to his uh, supervisor and at this time, he requested a, a formal reasonable accommodation for his disability. And the accommodation he, was, he had requested was simply the reinstatement of the flexible work schedule that he originally had. The employer refused to grant the plaintiff uh, that reasonable accommodation. And in turn, the plaintiff had to file a complaint with the EEOC, like we just talked about. So when you file a complaint with the EEOC, uh, the employer doesn't always know that. Uh, but in this case, the employer actually discovered uh, that um, this employee had filed a complaint against them. And so after learning that, um, they retaliated against the employee and they changed his work requirements. They required him to submit overly burdensome documentation about the hours that he was working. Uh, they investigated him. And they also told him for no reason whatsoever that his job is going to be outsourced. So uh, that is how all this case was shaping up before the court saw it. And when it reached the court, uh, they determined that it would be allowed to proceed to the next phase of litigation. And what that means is that the court found that the plaintiff's skin conditions were so severe that they actually qualified as a disability. And so that's a very important piece here. The court said, yes, uh, this disability interferes with your ability to work so much that we're going to give you, we're going to allow you to be protected by the ADA. 
And so that's one example of how all these concepts come together. Uh, the court didn't actually weigh the merits of the disability claim. It was merely allowing it to proceed to the next step. Um, but we're hopeful that after our webinar today and, and with uh, all, all this great conversation that we've had, that uh, if this uh, issue arises in your workplace, that you're able to more easily work through it. And so that concludes my part of the presentation, and we'll be turning now to uh, questions and answers. Thank you, John. Hey, great job, everyone. Uh, terrific information. Uh, as John said, we're now going to take some questions. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A pane that's at the bottom of the attendee control panel. So, Stacy, do we have any queued up? Yeah, uh, John, there, it looks like there was one last slide. Did you want to cover that, or should we go straight to the Q&A? Yeah, I, I had forgotten about that. Let me revisit that right now. So, <laughs> we had uh, just quickly shuffled some things around here. So, we did have some uh, other points we wanted to share with you. Um, outside of the reasonable accommodations process, the ADA does uh, offer some additional uh, protections to employees. Uh, so we detail some of that on the screen here, but I'll walk you through it. Um, but as an employer, uh, you are required to offer health coverage equally to all of your employees, regardless of their disability status. Uh, you may not ground your decision to fire or hire someone based on their disability status. And you may also not refuse to offer them health coverage because they have a disability that could be costly to treat. So you may not discriminate against someone because they are related to someone with a disability or if they are associated with someone with, who has a disability. This would include discriminating against someone based only on the fact that they are in a relationship with a disabled person. So an example of how this could play out is you have an employee who has a child who has atopic dermatitis. Um, it would be discrimination to refuse to offer that person health coverage uh, because you know that they would likely use it to treat their child's uh, skin condition, and that would be costly. So uh, just to reiterate, uh, while you have to offer health coverage equally to all employees, you're not required to offer uh, specific health coverage that includes benefits that would treat an employee's disability if they've disclosed that to you. So that means that if you have an employee with a serious dermatological condition, such as psoriasis, you must offer that employee health coverage on equal terms as all other employees. However, that health coverage would not have to include coverage for treatments that treat psoriasis. So that being said, we do recommend that employers voluntarily offer comprehensive coverage to all employees to improve productivity, increase quality of life, and reduce absenteeism. So now we can turn it over to Q&A. Thank you, Stacey. No problem. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Um, yeah, so we do have some questions here. It looks like the first question is, can we ask an employee that works with young children for a doctor's note that states their dermatological condition is not contagious? I think, John, that was for you. I'm having to think about that for a second. Could you just repeat the question? Absolutely. It says, can we ask an employee that works with, a young, children, with young children for a doctor's note that states their dermatological condition is not contagious? So I think we're assuming here that um, the employee in question has disclosed their disability to the employer. Um, and I do think it would be reasonable just to request that documentation. Uh, I don't think it would be overly burdensome um, on that employee as long as you're not treating that employee differently than others. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, I have, it looks like this question is for uh, Dr. Feldman. Do you feel employers and insurers should be more informed about the impact of skin conditions? Um, gosh, you know, I'm a, a physician. I don't work with those groups closely, so I don't know how informed they already are. Um, but, um, yeah, to whatever extent they, um, they need information, uh, hopefully they're, they're, um, they're knowledgeable about it. You know, I, I'm always looking for selection bias. I guess the only times I hear it come up is when the employer insurer is not knowledgeable. And so it seems like they're not knowledgeable a lot of the time, but the 99.9% .9 of the times they are knowledgeable, I, I wouldn't hear about it. 
Yeah, that, I think that makes sense. And I think it it always helps to to um get up to date and be informed about the people that you work with and learn about their conditions so you can create a welcoming environment and in, in, in the workplace. And so they feel comfortable coming forward with reasonable accommodations and feel comfortable asking questions about their health benefits and things of that nature. Um Kelly, I think this one this one's for you. Um how could your could an employer have helped with your condition? Um, definitely by offering a health insurance policy that would give me the option to get the medications that I needed. Also, um, to just be sensitive to the suffering. Um, and like I said earlier, just provide an environment and a culture that people feel safe enough to go and talk with their employers about that. Um, just all of the discussion on discrimination, it is you know, very touchy when you're on the other side of that and you're being asked for notes and, um, you know, thought to be contagious, you grow up with that. And so there can be a lot of sensitivity there. So I would say as an employer, just be very, you know, courteous and polite and explain it instead of, you know, doing it, doing it in a harsh manner. If that's something that's necessary, of course, that's understandable. Um, but just establishing that kind of a relationship and culture goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. And John, at this, there's one more question that this one's for you. What happens if the employer and employee come up with an accommodation, but it doesn't end up working out very well for the employer after trying it out for a few weeks? What can the employer do? Yeah, that's a great question. So like I mentioned earlier, when, when you're going through the process to come up with uh, what the reasonable accommodation could be, uh, when you're going through that, you should come up with a list of possible solutions. And uh, the result of that should be you selecting one of those solutions. And so here we have a case where the one solution that they decided on maybe didn't work out the way they originally thought that it would. Uh, and so if that happens to you, the best thing to do is just to, to go through the process again, meet with the employee and come up with another way to make things work uh, that, that works for them. Well, yeah, that sounds great. Well, I think great it looks question. like yeah. Oh, actually, it looks like we have one more question here. Um, for an ADA disability determination, is it a specific diagnostic code that is required or simply something as generic as eczema? I can take that one. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said at the beginning of, the, of my presentation, um, most dermatological conditions wouldn't categorically be included in the definition of disability. So. Uh, if a court or the EEOC or another adjudicator were to be determining if someone with a dermatological condition actually qualifies as disabled, um, they're probably not going to be looking at diagnosis codes. They're going to be looking at that person's individual situation and what their abilities are and how they're affected and what their job is um, to determine if that's going to really qualify them for the disability protection and, and the uh, reasonable accommodation. So they're, they're going to be looking holistically at the whole situation and just saying, I have eczema is not going, not going to complete that inquiry. Thank you. It looks like that's all the questions we have. Well, Did great. That, that was outstanding. Thanks so much, everyone. That, that's going to conclude our webinar for today. Um, really want to thank you all for joining us. Before we get close, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Sanofi, Regeneron, and Leo Pharma, and again, express our sincerest appreciation to our three expert panelists, Dr. Feldman, Kelly, and John. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. And uh, if anybody would like any additional information, their contact information is on that screen. Um, we're, there's also going to be a survey sent out to you that we're hoping you'll fill out, give us feedback. Um, other than that, I just want to thank everybody again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of HR.com, I would really love to thank our panelists today. That was a very enlightening um, presentation, and I'm sure it was very well received. To our audience, if you'd like to view this webcast again, the archive recording and slides will be available for up to seven days for our free members. And if you have a recertification membership, you have unlimited access to all of our webcasts. The webcast credit will show up in your HR.com account within two business days. We will also send you an email with the credit information. 
Your feedback is important to us, so please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer, or click on the link to the survey in the chat area of your webcast controls. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.